Com, the greatest scorer of all time, and scoring is not even his. Just because mate. you have the most points doesn't make you the greatest scorer of all time. There are people that have a greater scoring average. The accomplishment longevity is the reason he's longevity. That doesn't make him the greatest scorer. What does it mean then? Nothing can make him the greatest score. That's why you all want to talk about he went, he's been to nine finals. The dude is below 500 in the finals. Like y'all celebrate being below 500? You're only below 500 because you've been go. so many times. Go ahead and make the excuses. You're only, only been so many times. You're the, on greatest. Top of that. you're the greatest, but you're only below 500 because of this and because of that. Because of the, what, what do you mean? Man. It's not always something. It's, it's always, always something, man. It's always somebody out there. That you have to, to find an excuse credit. or a narrative to support somebody. So That's what's really the narrative bad. behind having the most points in NBA history? What's that narrative? You play long enough, you'll get there. It's the same. <laughs> so is, is John Stockton the greatest point guard ever? Because he has the most assists. We're not talking about a guy that's no, no. not LeBron James. It's the same principle. We're talking about LeBron principle. James. John Stockton played for like five decades, dude. Of course he's going to have the most assists in NBA history. He played so forever. Me, there's been a ton of guys. There's been a handful of guys that have played as long as LeBron, and there's been a ton of guys that have been considered a better scorer that doesn't have the amount of points that LeBron has. And all of that is secondary to the fact that scoring isn't even LeBron's first attribute. That's a lie. That's he's what been, makes he's it been crazy. the best score on every every team he's played on. That's another okay. narrative. That's, that's not, not that's y'all act like he's that's Maggie not Johnson. Saying much. You act like that's he's Maggie Johnson much. and he came in averaging triple doubles like from the jump. Like, stop. He's been the leading scorer on every team he's ever played on. So that narrative of him not being a scorer. Is false. Stop. But but listen, you're talking about on teams where who else is on the team? What are you talking about? Who else has been on the team where he's had to uh, not be the leading scorer of? So he had to be the leading scorer in Miami? He had to be? Yes. He, well, he wasn't winning the championship. Mm -hmm. D-Wade wasn't taking the knees to the championship. Okay. Leading the team scoring. Okay. And nobody on the Cleveland Cavaliers at any point leading the team scoring would be anywhere close to where LeBron is right now. So basically what you're telling me is his whole career, he had to be a scorer. Thank you for proving my point. No, Thank you for proving my point. Thank you for proving my score. point. Because the narrative of that's not what, no, that's what, since he came to the league, that's what he was because he had to be. He's a scorer. He has to it. score, but he's not a scorer. Lucky Lefty Podcast. Crazy. Always. Always, we fight against fallacies on this podcast. I don't know why you want that, babe? this dude right here decides to wear the second best jersey ever in the history of the NBA. I don't know. Dude couldn't even get his own number. Like 23 was already taken, already legendary. I'm you not know. Great show today, though. Great show. Yeah, We're going to talk about Samuel and Pimba. He was on Irish Players Club. Fantastic interview. Um, Notre Dame fans should have come away from that, that spaces, Twitter spaces you had with him, feeling like Notre Dame was the leader. I know I came away from the interview thinking that he Notre Dame was leading. He uh, moved his visit back from June back to the Clemson game in November. We'll talk about that. Former Notre Dame linebacker, national champion, Wes Pritchett, joins us. Kid that left Atlanta, Georgia to come to Notre Dame when he was being recruited. I want to talk to him about that because we have some kids making decisions like that in Caleb Downs and Jaden Osbury. Do they decide to stay in the South or do they come to Notre Dame? We'll talk about how difficult it was for him to make that transition and ultimately, you know, win a national championship at Notre Dame. And then we got to get into some other stuff, man. Nick Saban copping a plea now, right? And so, you know what? If you make a mistake, if you say something now, 
and you make a mistake and it goes viral, just own own it. Own it. Don't start, you know, getting into semantics. Well, I didn't really say, come on, you knew what you were saying, Nick. You do exactly what you were trying to say. It's all good. Like, you still have the best team in college football right now. It's all good. It's all good. Marcus Freeman and Notre Dame, they're coming. They're coming. But as it stands right now, you got the best quarterback in college football. I want to talk to you about that because we talked about Mel Kuyper's top 10 right on this big board. Notre Dame has two people. Isaiah Foskey and Michael Mayer in the top 25. Who would you take Stroud between the two quarterbacks and Bryce? Like I really was thinking about that. Because if you look at they both are surrounded by supreme talent. They both had like supreme wide receivers. Number one, Alabama offensive line struggled. Ohio State's offensive line struggled last year. They both had, I would say, Travion Henderson is probably a better running back than Brian Robinson. So I, Ohio State probably had a better running game last year. Maybe. Man, yeah. For me, I just – the physical tools, I think I would probably take Stroud, but it's just something about Bryce that he brings to the huddle. That's an intangible. Like, I just go back to as losing both of your receivers and literally being one reception away from winning the national championship game. Like, that ball he threw to Algie Hill Hall was right on his fingertips, man. In a championship game, like the moxie of this kid, the confidence this kid has, like nothing rattles him. Going back to the Auburn game, like, yo, get on my back. Let's go. Let's go win this game. It's something about him to me that just separates him from CJ that I think ultimately will get a team to say, you know what, give us Bryce Young. Over CJ Stroud. Yeah, I think uh Bryce had a little bit more expectation on him winning the Heisman, even getting the NIL deal mm -hmm. that people were talking about being a millionaire before he even played a snap. Facts. So I think he's had to handle a little bit more mm -hmm. than CJ has, just because it's comfortable in the Big Ten. As Ohio State, you know, I talked to a guy yesterday, played for Michigan State. And they just like, as long as we beat Ohio State, you're good. Nothing else really is the goal for them. They're not even thinking championship. So uh, CJ being on the best team as other teams are looking at like that, I mean, it's not the same as you could potentially lose at Alabama. At the same time, everybody knows you or expects you to win and knows your win. Yeah. The SEC, you can mess around and lose if you're not playing at the elite level that we believe that uh, he can play at. So him having to play an A game as well as having the talent around him as well as playing where he was at with the things he was asked to do, I think it was much more of a requirement than CJ where I think his receivers carried him a little bit more than what Bryce receivers did for him. Yeah. You know what? I, I really gave some thought to that because I want to be fair to CJ. And I'll say this. Bryce was definitely more consistent from the first game. CJ struggled, especially in that first game against Minnesota. But once CJ hit his stride, I think like after week four or five, the numbers he was putting up was like flat out ridiculous. I was like, okay. And you have to be – quarterback play is the determining factor a lot of times, right? Because you have – of course, we know Georgia was able to win with Stetson Bennett 
or Benson, as you normally call him. And <laughs> I gotta get that right, by the way. <laughs> that's some good. Yeah. And that's outside the norm, though. That's out. That's 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 not the norm. It's like normally you're gonna have a kid like Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, win a national championship because quarterbacking in today's football is paramount. Which makes, you know, if you missed yesterday's show, not only was it a great interview. Well, a former Notre Dame. Well, well, if you think about it too, it's just an interesting dynamic when it comes to that because how yeah. do you, <laughs> how do you, uh, I don't know how you say it, but I do think the, the cool thing about what Bryce is being able to do yeah. is put his team in position at number one and keep it at number one. I think that's a hard thing more so than individual um, expectation because the team expectation and what Nick Saban carries with that, it's hard to stay the number one guy on the hill as yeah. opposed to kind of yeah. service. I, I agree. I agree with that. And for me, that's something – does that weigh on Tyler Buckner? Because the expectations might not be as high, but on the flip side, there is the, the cloud of – Notre Dame quarterbacks. Like, is that something Tyler Buckner's thinking about? Is this something that he's allowing to himself to be motivated by to say, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and prove that I'm a guy. Cause I know Tommy Reese wants to prove that he's an elite offensive coordinator. Yeah. I think I can speak. For, I would hope, you know, I would hope that Tyler would be, excited for the challenge and, and understanding of where he's at being at Notre Dame that, you know, you are expected of a certain level of play and yeah, yeah. overall ability. And so that's always existing there, especially with just the competition and all those things included. But I do think that uh, also what makes it cool that what I've experienced being there in that position is that you're so involved with trying to get better and staying engaged and staying in the moment that mm -hmm. you don't really think about it too much. Yeah. You know, hindsight after the game, when you're watching the ESPN, all the reviews, you're like, okay, that's what we did. That's what we accomplished. But you're so forward thinking and, and almost staying in a moment where it, that's what they say. It passes you by fast. Cause you'll look up and be like, damn, I'm a senior. <laughs> so I do think that, because it'll be so much involved in his in, in, in intermediate circle that he's not going to be so focused on the pressure of okay, I got to carry this thing all the way there, or just be a big motive, a big piece of carrying all the way there. So doing your job, which they preach a lot, especially Harry Heastan, it really is psychologically gets you locked into just what does it take to do the next task, which kind of keeps you focused on that everything else that can distract you. I'm wondering with this quarterback class being held as a pretty good class from a depth standpoint, you have guys like Will Levis from Kentucky, the Richardson kid down in Florida, which you know, the Richardson kid is in the same boat as Tyler Buckner, like athletic with a lot to prove, like still has a lot to prove. But I would venture to say that Tyler has a better team around him. You know what I'm saying? So the strength of this team makes me feel confident in what Tyler Buckner ultimately can do in his development. And this is just a continuation of the show we had yesterday. You know, great interview with Pete Bursich, but also just your conversation and the way you broke down the three things that are really needed for Tyler Buckner to take the next step in his development, right? And not worrying so much about, and, and most people might not want to hear this, right? Become the quarterback that you need to become to win games. Focus on that, right? Like you'll get to the other things, 
all right? But become really good at these two or three things and then allow the team around you to help you. All right. Because it's not like he doesn't have talent around him. Yeah, Tyler Bugner definitely can develop faster around teams that are well-equipped. I'll give you a perfect example of Deshaun when I got hurt was able to transition in a team where he played at a high level because he had high level players around him. Mm. When you got Quentin Nelson, Mike McGlinchey, Ronnie Stanley, Nick Martin in front of you, CJ right there, all-star guys on the outside, you can ease your mind a little bit more to where you're like, I don't have to be perfect. I can miss and still be right. Have a chance of having a high success at the play with Will Fuller, with a right. Corey Robinson, with a Amir Carlisle. So uh, that makes it a little easier to progress and feel confident and getting better. But expectations always changes those dynamics. But in this case for Tyler, he's in a real good spot. Lucky Lucky Podcast. We're brought to you and featuring Anora Risk, Anora Whiskey, AnoraWhiskey.com. It's the premium American whiskey, AnoraWhiskey.com. And if you drink, make sure that you drink responsibly. We have our special guest for today, Wes Pritchett, joining us in a little bit. Can't wait to talk to him. You know what? Everyone talks about one specific game from that 1988 season, bro. And I would venture to say that it wasn't even the best game. And I'm speaking from the, the teenager, the young teenager that was watching the entire season unfold. I don't think the Miami game was the most exciting game of that season. I can't wait to see if he agrees. We'll talk about it. I understand it was Miami, you know, it was Jimmy Johnson. That's John. where it was at, yeah. Yeah, but it was yeah, like. There's convict narrative. Yeah, all of that. that and don't get me wrong. That was bonkers, right? Game of the century up to that point. Yeah. But there was another game that, in my opinion, had my heart beating a little bit faster. Mm. Yeah, so we'll talk about that. Was it an academy time. school? Just let me know now. Was it an academy school game? No, or... no, 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 no. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. That schedule from that year, I'm going to ask him about that too. That schedule that they played that year, it's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. So we play a little game because you know he's in uh he's into uh securities. So we play a little buy or sell game with him. <laughs> okay. We play, like give him certain topics, ask him whether he is he buying or is he selling. Mm. Yeah. Any so let's see, is it in court? You know what? Lucas Chapman had a that's for you. You know about the jersey. You know that's not that's not that's not the case at all because mm, it's kind of similar. Ian Book and wins equate to team accolades. When you're individually getting buckets like LeBron James, <laughs> that's different. Now if Ian had the most touchdowns in Notre Dame history. I'm like, yeah, okay, I get what you mean. But even Ian with the most wins in Notre Dame history don't got the most touchdowns, which makes my point even better that LeBron James, even with a longevity award, you still don't know that you can get 40,000 points, not even being the known as a scorer, known as a passer. I'm still trying to figure out when he wasn't known as a scorer. Like I'll give you a perfect example. Kevin Durant has one attribute, and that's getting a basket. That's a score. It's not true. Kevin Durant – won't That's hit the Kevin Durant. True. What basketball do you watch? He has one attribute? What are you talking about? The best about? attribute that Kevin Durant has is a score. Okay, you, now That's you said it. best. You said the one. You said he has one attribute. That's what you originally said. Okay, that's the same thing. You know why? Oh. Because we saw what Boston did to him. He can't do nothing other than score. He can't play make. He can't play. Oh, wait a minute. So... If Boston double team LeBron, he we've seen what they tried to do. LeBron and his his great feats with Detroit, his great, great feats with the Celtics, his great feats just in general in the playoffs. The only time he had a fault was against the Mavs. But we can excuse that because you've been so many times. I mean, 
Man, let's dig in before Wes Pritchard joins us in a minute, man. Let's dig into this month. And it's a very pivotal month in recruiting. Um, you talked to one of the recruits that was originally scheduled to come in the weekend of the 17th through the 19th that has pushed his official visit back to the Clemson game in November. And Samuel and Pimbo, what did you take from the interview you had with him on the Irish Players Club? Man, you can tell that he really wants to get to the next level. And, you know, he's really locked in and focused on that. And he's leaning on his mom and his his, his parents pretty heavily on them having to like the place too. And I was telling uh <laughs> I was telling some of the guys, I'm like, I think Notre Dame can convince moms better than Georgia can. So he was saying that may be one of the factors that that are that are that are must and i'm like if notre dame does a pretty good job of women winning some mamas over as a as compared to what i would think of georgia could so yeah i think that puts us in a good space i think he's a fun guy uh somebody that really just is determined to want to play football i mean his inspiration was bama yeah at the seventh grade and it is interesting to see him be able to open up more knowing that that was what he really, really wanted. But to see him be like, okay, let me try to take my time a little bit is is, is good to see from a guy who uh, is getting offers from everywhere. So I think we have a really good place in his heart so far. Uh, he seems to like Marcus Freeman a lot. Uh, and we can only hope we can close. You know, liking Marcus Freeman is like an understatement. When it comes to these recruits, yeah. and I just want to point out that there was an article that dropped on yesterday uh, coming out of one of the Southern SI sites about uh, Cedric Irvin Jr. and his family being upset with Marcus Freeman about the way things went down. Uh, we kind of had a heads up that it was coming, and it wasn't as scathing as I originally thought it would be. But it was amazing that in the midst of that, his father, his father said, and this is why things happen the way they happen sometimes in life, bro. His father says that was the school he loved. That was the school his mother loved. But I always wanted him to go somewhere else. And I'm like, well, you know what? I'm glad he's not coming. I'm glad, I, man, you know, if you come, I would love for everyone to be on board to come to a place like Notre Dame. Like Cedric Irvin, young man from down there in Florida. He went to Michigan State. He might have wanted his son to follow in his footsteps and go to Michigan State. Heck, he might want him to stay home, close to home, and go to one of the Florida schools. Heck, yeah. Lance Taylor is the offensive coordinator at Louisville. That's who recruited him. Mm -hmm. Gave him the offer and got him to commit. Maybe he goes and he signs with Louisville. Go whatever. Go to the place that makes you happy. Go to the place. You and your family. Absolutely. Well, and that's important because usually you go to the place that makes you happy. The things that happen that you can't control don't get to you as much. You know, and I think that matters right. on staying the course. That, you know, staying the course doesn't mean you always have to go through the crazy shit, you know. Yeah. yeah <laughs> you can that. stay on a happy course. It may take a little longer, but at least you can have a, a solid mind getting through it. So I think that's a better way of getting through it than just trying to be too detailed to where you go somewhere and you're like, I've analytically think this is the best place, but end up not liking the experience. So we come out of that and we go into the month of June, as you said before, very pivotal month, Irish invasion. Pretty much starts today. Kids are on campus right now. The big weekend starts with Elijah Page, offensive tackle, coming in with your guy, 2024 running back out of Wisconsin, Corey Smith. You love that kid. Corey Smith is nice. Corey Smith. I mean, but, you know, looking at the kind of running back recruits we're getting, I got to have to hold my tongue until we get closer to us landing some of the attention of these five-star guys. Yeah. Then you have offensive line and Joe Auden coming in, Miles Graham, the linebacker, 24, Caleb Beasley, 24, and Jacob Oden, 24, out of Harper, Harper Woods High School in Harper Woods, Michigan. 
spoke with him and his dad this morning, and they just rave about the relationship that exists between Marcus Freeman and the entire coaching staff. He's super excited to get back on campus on this weekend. June 10th through 12th, huge weekend. Rico Flores, who has his decision coming up on the 3rd of July. Ronan Hannafin, who is a pretty much heavy lean to Notre Dame right now, bro. Man, I don't know if you've seen the film on this kid. This kid is quick and dangerous with the ball in his hand. And the only reason he's not really getting buzzed is because he plays in Massachusetts. That's pretty much oh, it. Oh, well. But, you know, I uh, man, we you have to watch it. back from Massachusetts, so. Cooper Flanagan is tight end. He's a commit. Sullivan Absher commit. Sam Pendleton commit. Sam Pendleton has been working on Charles Sack. Jagger saw this week. You saw he put out a, a, a nice little post on Twitter and Instagram with both of them. Uh, both of them in the picture. Monroe Freeling. Big kid, it comes down to Notre Dame and Clemson more than likely. Devin Houston is a commit that'll be in. Jason Moore, he'll be coming in with his boy Devin Houston. Hopefully, Jason Moore can go ahead and commit. Jaden Osbury, Christian Gray, uh, someone you might be talking to tomorrow night at Irish Players Club. And you have Jeff White, cornerback out of the 25 class, Adon Schuler, Caleb Downs, Micah Tease, and Grant Reddick. That is a star packed and vitally important weekend for Notre Dame to do what you just talked about, and that's close the deal. Close the deal is vitally important. I think, you know, the one thing we do well is is consistency. So you're not really going to catch us too many on the bad days because the grass is always going to be cut. You know, the flower is always going to be out, even if yeah. it's two degrees outside. <laughs> And that just goes to how the inside of Notre Dame campus and the building and people are and the buildings are as well. It's hard to catch them on a bad day. So I think because of how Marcus Freeman has built this program so far, this is going to be a weekend that's enjoyable. I mean, all the guys that you talk to say it's never about football. So I wonder if they may actually talk some football being in the facility and, and enough football to get them convinced that being a, and stay, sticking together as a class yeah. and forming a class like this can be something special for all of them involved. And on the 13th through the 15th, so that's two days, Richard Young, number one running back in the nation out of Florida, will be on campus, and he'll be alone. Like, it's just him. The entire time Notre Dame is going to be selling him on Notre Dame. That's key. And then that weekend, the 17th through the 19th, out of St. Louis, running back Jeremiah Love from Christian Brothers, Jaden Greyhouse, Brennan Vernon, Notre Dame commit, Jordan Hall, the linebacker, Micah Bell, who is leaning, according to reports, towards Notre Dame, Josiah Wagner, cornerback, and Christian Hamilton is the new 23 offer at the wide receiver position out of North Carolina. Talked to his head coach yesterday. His head coach, who has been coaching for over 20 years, said he's the best player I've ever coached. Who he's is? the best player I've ever coached. Christian Hamilton. He just got offered by Notre Dame and Chancey Stuckey, I believe, over the weekend. He's a 23 wide receiver, 6'2", about 190 pounds, out of North Carolina. If I'm not mistaken, I believe it's the Asheville area, if I'm not mistaken. But, yo, you look at his film – Another explosive kid. Chancey Stuckey is finding. And what's his name? Christian Hamilton. Why you might want to get him on Irish yeah. Players Club. Say it again. I'm trying to say, why is that? I'm just thinking, why does that sound so familiar? But it said the best player, huh? His head coach, who's been coaching for over 20 years, said he's the best football player I've ever coached. Wow. So when he said that, I was like, okay, all right. <laughs> That's... Wow. That's that's pretty cool. But no, the Ronan Hannafin, I think Ronan Hannafin, Hannafin for me is the most underrated wide receiver out of all of the guys that are left on the board. Just my really? opinion. Why is that? Man, dude, because you watch his film, and I understand, you know, people are like, well, who is he really playing? Look, I don't care what anybody says. You run you fast. Said, you run Natalie fast. supersedes the competition around him. Say it again. It's saying the talent supersedes the competition around him. 
Well, that's like saying, you know, just because Josh Burnham, who has been killing it this spring, played in one of the lowest uh, classes in Michigan. If you're good, you're good, bro. Like, yeah. if you're good, you're good. <laughs> if you're good, you're good. And it, with some of these kids like Ronan Hannafin, man, they're not going to get – if Ronan Hannafin played in Florida, he probably he might be a borderline five star. See, that's saying a lot. Hey, I'm trying to tell you, I I I challenge you to go watch his film. That's all I'm saying. But it's like the competition around him is going to boost that the the talent in my eyes. I feel like. No, I, you're I like, Dang, he, he's moving at another speed, but it's like the Navajos kids or something. Like, you know, they're not playing nobody. No, it's like hearing that a kid, it's this kid that hoops coming out of middle Rhode Island. Island, like Rhode Island somewhere. You're like, what? If he can hoop, he can hoop. Is he a Cooper Cup type of guy? Bigger. Probably faster. I don't Man. know if he's a technician. I, you, you, come on, dude. You know wide receivers in high school aren't asked to be technicians. I'm trying to think. For you to say a five-star if he wasn't playing in Massachusetts. No, I'm saying he's already a four-star playing in Massachusetts, and I feel like he gets a raw deal or is like kind of like underrated because he plays in Massachusetts. I think people look and say, well, he plays in Massachusetts. They look at the film and they see the talent. They see the speed. He's sub four or five. So they're like, okay, he's real athletically, but who is he really playing? Okay. Like running so away what is your body, but what is your synopsis on the the Jewish player that's like super nice in D3? They call him the Jewish Jordan or something like that. What do you mean? What's my synopsis? Like, do I think he's an NBA player? Yeah. Do you think he's like draft all of that? He'll get the opportunity. Oh, okay. But he has to prove that. That's my point. Like, I can go oh, watch him play and say, yo, he has skills. I'll give you a, I'll give you a perfect example, right? Um, If you go watch Jimmer for that, who? You'll say to yourself, there's no way this dude isn't in the NBA. Right? Because you just watch this dude play pick and roll and shoot jumpers all day and knock it down, make passes. You're like, okay, yeah, he can play in the NBA. But then he gets in the NBA camp and you ask yourself, why doesn't he stick? Why can't he stick? How much of a liability is he defensively? You know, when he comes around and they jump the screens, how does he handle it? There's so many things that are nuances. It's so many, Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's so many things that go into it. Right. So you're asking me, I'm giving my opinion based upon what I'm watching in high school, and that's all I can do, right? Like, okay, this kid is fast and is a four-star. The fact that he's a four-star from Massachusetts says a lot, in my opinion. In my opinion, because I don't think I don't think you respect football in Massachusetts. Let's keep it real. Now, that's now why I think Bubakar. That's why I think someone you talk to, Bubakar Traore. I think he's a beast. I just don't think he gets as much I think respect. Bubakar's a beast because he's coming from Massachusetts. I don't think people respect him. I think they're like, okay, this is a kid that was committed to Boston College. Okay, Boston College. I I think he's going to be a beast. Well, I see, I see the little tape. You know, I just watched then, a little bit of the tape. I think that he's he actually looks really good on like just an athlete perspective. That's what I'm like, saying. You know, he's a better athlete like than a, most people think. Like a Taysom Hill. <laughs> that's that's who you're talking about. You know what? And you know why I said Taysom Hill? Because at the end of the day, with a kid like this, he doesn't have a position. 
because at the end of the day, on top of that, mm-hmm. he's average at any spe- any specific position. He's a good football player. Right, right. But if you put him in a room full of running backs, he'll be like the bottom half of the town. But if you put him in a room full of receivers, he's probably the bottom half of the receivers. Right. But if you put him on special teams, he might be an All-American. That's the type of player he is. Hey, I just think he's a better athlete than most people give him credit. What's more oh, important in your mind? Do you that's think? All I'm do you think that, like for instance, the way Marcus Freeman has brought in a lot of two-way athletes? Yeah, is that a positive over the the getting a specific, let's say, Carnell Tate, who's Bona fide receiver, five star. That's all he do. I mean, you build, you build a room, right? Let's say he ends up being. Now you tell me whether or not, and will Wes Pritchard will be joining us shortly, and you know he's he can hear us right now. If I asked you who was more important to Deshaun Watson, Mike Williams or Hunter Renfro, what would you say? Mike Williams. And some people might argue that Hunter Renfro, less talented, but what he brought to that wide receiver position and the blanket that he was, the security blanket he was for Deshaun on third downs, some people might disagree. That's called, like, that's, called, that's called play calls, though. You're the quarterback. I lean to you on that. I won't disagree so with I'm you. I'm like, that. okay, third down. I'm gonna call something for a guy specific. You would hope, yep. right? I mean, yep. you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, Lucky Lucky Podcast, we spin it different. Special guest getting ready to join us right now. He is a former Notre Dame linebacker. He is a member of the 1988 National Championship team. He is one of the best ambassadors for Notre Dame football in the University of Notre Dame. And we want to welcome him in to the Lucky Lefty podcast right now, none other than Wes Pritchett. What's up? Wes, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Hey, Malik. How, how was your holiday? Too short. <laughs> <laughs> it was right. good. I had a good time. It was real. Actually, I, I, uh, I didn't do very much. I was going to go out of town, and then I ended up hanging around here and playing golf and going to the pool and hanging, going to a barbecue. I've got my, uh, I've got two boys that are getting recruited in football. And so we're getting ready to go on a big, uh, like the next two weeks, I think I go to eight camps or something like that with the boys. Oh, yeah, The whole different world than what I grew up in. I can tell you oh, that. Yeah, it's, it's similar different. nothing. Mm-hmm. So before <laughs> we get to that, how, how, sorry. Did you shoot? how did you shoot this weekend? I played pretty well. I mean, I'm a four handicap. Nice. So I take it pretty seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. I think Malik and I, when we go on the course, where you can just call us handicaps. Like, we, yeah, yeah, we, you know, I look, I, I've been as high as a 15. I, I grew up playing golf, though. So, my, my, somehow, I, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a, Contradiction. I, I was I was grew up playing golf, and then I played inside linebacker. So I, I don't know how that worked. Um, and I loved golf. Golf was probably my second favorite sport. So, wow. good story. So we were going to save this until the end of the interview. But with your experience and securities, we want to play a game called buy a sell with you because you opened the door for it. I got that's that right. figured out. You buy high, you sell low. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's you right. Talk about I did. By the deal. How things have changed from a recruiting standpoint. Are you buying or selling the way things are now in recruiting versus how they were when you were being recruited? I mean, I think I'm just accepting. You know, I can't mm. – I don't have time to figure out what's right or wrong. I've got – you know, it's just – what I'm trying to figure out is, first of all, what's the process? Yeah. Well, how do these kids get these stars? And all this stuff, like you know, you're talking about, you're talking about. I mean, you've got 
all the 2025 kids classified. Really, you got ninth graders ranked already and for top 300. You know what I look like in ninth grade versus what I look like my senior year? I mean, I, I grew, I probably grew, I'm not even joking, probably 10 inches and gained 40 pounds. I mean, yeah. you know, it's it's a little frustrating. I, I think you, you have to be in big immediate attention um, to or have some kind of pedigree or, you know, I, we just didn't know. My kids are really good in lacrosse as well, so they – and I didn't know anything about that sport. So I had to that whole process is even weirder than football. It's all about the club teams and the two or three tournaments. And I was a junior and we spent his whole song get camps. I mean, getting in these, playing on these national teams and playing on these, in these across tournaments. It's offers in Division One lacrosse, and then he tells me this summer that he wants to play football after we've so, did the whole thing. The sophomore year, we should have been going to these. So the football camps are huge. So you go up and you go to Notre Dame and Wisconsin or whoever, you know, you get invited to or you want to be invited to, and you make sure those are in zone. Uh, evaluation, if you will. And so, um, you know, he missed all that. Senior tape, I mean, I've never seen, I haven't seen a better tape yet. This kid's tape is unbelievable, but I mean, who's he playing against? So he, being a long, long story short, he was ACL in March. So now he's already had the surgery around his rehab. So now I don't know what the hell. Because he still got offers from like Air Force, Army, Navy, uh, Air Patrol. So he was getting a lot of interest from Power Five guys, and now he's kind of on the back burner. So now I may reclass him. So I don't know what I'm, I'm – that's a long-winded way of saying I don't know how the hell this crew somehow slide our force – Stars up hundred, you got it made. Once you get your power five offer, you tip made. It's that yeah. first offer, and then these guys all fall in line. I mean, you know, my kids ask me how I got recruited. I mean, this is the honest to God truth. I have no clue. Hell, <laughs> one day, I don't know how the hell Clemson and Georgia and Notre. I really have no idea how I got. We didn't do anything, you know. So now it's you have your Twitter account. You have to be your DMing coach constantly. You're updating constantly. I mean, and I told my kids, I said, take a step back. This is your first job interview. You got to go sell yourself. What is your dad? I've been selling myself for 55 years. I haven't had very much to sell, and I still sold it. So you guys have talent. Now it's you got to go out there and make these people believe. You have to. Yep. Old and they think, like yeah, that's that's a really good idea. And then their girlfriend calls and they leave. So, <sighs> Man, I'll tell you what, though, I have spent more time and effort on this shit than I ever dreamed I would. But you know, at the same time, my buddy's like, "Yeah, well, you're trying to get a free education." I said, "Yeah, that's a good point." So I guess I look at it like a seven hundred thousand dollar commitment. So I'm going to do it. That's right. I mean, in seventy five grand a year, brother. It's, it's not an easy thing. <laughs> Go to 80. And you know what's crazy is that you're right. Recruiting is is it's kind of like the NIL stuff. It's the wild, wild west. There's not a lot of direction on where to where to even start at. But do you find yourself kind of I don't know, like being more invested in trying to get your guys motivated with so many different distractions now that is way different than when we were getting recruited for sure. Well, I, I was a t-shirt and a pair of shorts to work out in when I was at Notre Dame, even 10, 15 years later, when you guys played, at least you had like a pair of that. I'm not joking. When Lou got there about six months in, we finally got an Adidas sweatsuit that had an interlocking ND. It's the only one I ever got to. Are you serious? 
So, you know, I think my kids, you know, in high school right now, the NIL thing is not anything that they're, that's, they just want to play. They want to live their dream and play, I think, in a power five school. So um, for them, they're not at the up or even thinking about NIL. They just want a spot on the team, which I think is great. Now that, um, but yeah, the world we live in, I mean, I've had, and you know, we, I've raised money for people and we, I, I understand a little bit. Um, this NIL thing, you talk, I mean, this is Pandora's box on steroids. <laughs> First box, and they opened up, um, you know, all the things that we were trying to protect in amateur athletics. Um, there's no regulation or rules or order. I mean, you can do you just totally vague name, image, likeness. And any clown in the world can come in and hand you supposedly money for you do a shoot a commercial. Yeah. And then there's like, well, you gotta be with this for market value. Well, for market value is what somebody will agree. So how do you argue if some guy pays this guy, whether it's egregious or not? Right? Yeah. So I mean, I, I don't I, I think it's killing me. I mean, you, you do something and it seems to be going pretty I'm, you know, and who made that decision? And we're in, in high school, which you know they're going to do. The this and the SA and the ACC can legally buy kids now. They are going to. Yeah. It, it, they're definitely going to buy them. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Wes, we're going to ask you to see if you can reconnect because you keep dropping in and out a little bit. I don't know really? if another a better signal you can get in the in the house or I I got a full signal. Let me try. I'll, I'll leave and come back. Okay. Yeah, we hope to get them back and hope to get a better signal and uh bring them back in immediately. Yeah, the crazy story but definitely. The fact that they yeah. just they just got a suit, a Adidas suit. I was about to say that. The craziest <laughs> one of those whole story is that they had to convince him to get just one. Just one. That's it. With the, the interlocking ND. Now, I thought we complained about them being stingy in the equipment room. Because I'd be like, hey, man, you got all those sweatshirts and shirts back there. Go ahead, you know. Right. Slide something to my little, my little cubby hole. Right. I couldn't imagine if we didn't get nothing. What are guys? What? You would have guys not having nothing to wear right now. Right. If we didn't have team issue gear as school for some of those guys. Man. That is amazing. I can't wait. Hope he comes back in and the signal is stronger because I need to ask a couple of Lou Holtz questions based upon Pete Burses told us they practice an hour on concrete, bro. That <laughs> yeah. that blew my mind. Like, what? Concrete. Yeah. He's like, the only thing we didn't do was tackle to the ground. And it's amazing. Ooh, that's where it's natural turf. You might be right. The original Astro Turf. The, original the fields Astro. they play on now. The fields these kids play on now feel like pillows. Like I tell you all the time, every time I walk into the practice facility at, at, at Notre Dame, it's like, yo, oh, this is crazy. This is crazy. I feel like you yeah, it's, that, it's crazy because it used to be just the practice field there. Now it's this mm -hmm. big mausoleum coliseum thing. And like it's cool because, like you said, you go in there and take a nap on the turf. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know how guys even get hurt no more. You falling on a soft cushion like that. Man, and it's amazing. It's connected to the rest of the facilities, the lacrosse team, baseball field. Everything is fantastic. And the baseball team, a lot of people felt like they can't get or they can't host the Super Regionals because the facilities – aren't big enough to host the crowd that the NCAA wants. And that's talking about Notre Dame might end up having to improve, you know, that part of the facility as well. So it's going to be very interesting to see how these kids come in this weekend or this month and they look at these facilities because, like you said, they're vastly improved from the way you see them. And Wes is going to join us again.
Hey, guys. All right, we got you. So this is, this is yeah, we want to get to Lou Holtz. You said you guys got an Adidas track suit and finally after he came. And I want to talk about the 1988 season, which eventually led to the last national championship in Notre Dame. And most people will go to the big matchup against the Miami Hurricanes. But there was a team that would play a pivotal role in that season for not only you guys in week one, but they almost ruined the importance of the Miami game in the middle of the season. And most people don't realize that Miami went up to Michigan and Michigan had a 19 point lead in that game before a furious comeback by Miami, right before they become the South Bend, which would have basically ruined like the buzz of that game and that matchup in South Bend between you guys and Miami. But I said this to Malik. I said, I'm going to ask Wes, because I remember as a teenager, my heart was probably beating faster during the Michigan game than it was during the Miami game. I think people, people forget just how good that first game against Michigan was when you guys came away with that 19 to 17 win. You know, um, that game always set the tone for um, the season. And that was, you know, I mean, the heyday of Bo Schimbeckler. Michigan was loaded. They were huge. I mean, every game we ever played, the first play of the game when those offensive linemen broke the huddle and came up to the line of scrimmage, you're just like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Still, they the biggest team I've ever on the field. And I've included. I'd never – they had – Jumbo Elliott was one tackle, and the other tackle, the guy was bigger than him. Skrepnik, look him up. He's like 6'7", 325. I mean, they were just freaking monsters. <laughs> and, you know, they had big 235, 40-pound fullbacks. And, I mean, it was just – if you go back and watch that game, it literally was just – we just stood – like two, bo- two heavyweight boxers standing in the middle of the ring and just punching each other. There was no – you know, a trick play was a counter. Oh goodness! Yeah. I mean, it, oh my goodness! Tight so It wasn't. It wasn't no I, tricking about it. It was. We're going to run you over. This is what we're. This is where we're running. Stop us on both sides. Of <laughs> and uh, you know, <laughs> they had a good kicker too. I think the guy's name was Gillette. Yeah, Mike Gillette. Uh, and uh, I'll never – we're winning 19-17 with, like, 30 seconds left. I'll never forget it. And Lou calls us – it's like a 40 – it wasn't a – it was 40-something. It wasn't, like, 49, though. It was probably, like, 42, 44. <laughs> and Lou calls us over. Just kill her. They're going to miss it. They're going to miss it. They sure as hell did. And, uh, we, and we win that game. And you're right. That was, that was huge. And, by the way – Supposedly, I, I don't know if this is right, but I think we beat Miami 31 to 30 that year. Right. And I, I, Michigan 31 to 30. Yep. Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's uh, correct. Crazy. Crazy yeah. game. So that game wasn't even, it wasn't a football game. That was a fight because you're not trying to even scheme. You're that's just saying we're. <laughs> we got pins in that game for criminals, which I've never even heard of. Like you gotta be. I go. I went back. I watch it only because I wanted to see. I mean, it looks yeah. like we were playing with leather helmets. It seems so long ago. I mean, I think the wide receivers were in three point stances. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. yeah, that's a long time ago, dude. I played a lot better before. Why? Oh man, a connection. I've got a great connection, so I don't know. I should full bars. Here, let me maybe it's me. Let me try. I'll try this time. Yeah, we'll try because usually it's much better if you're working on your phone to connect to the Wi Fi. Well, I got Wi Fi, so it's probably me. My Wi Fi's downstairs, but I got. 
Let's see. But yeah, Rock, are you done vacuuming. Are you done vacuuming? Okay. Let me go downstairs. All right. But yeah, that game for us, Wes, you know, when I look back at it, I remember my heart beating so much faster just watching that game because it was back and forth, heavyweight fight. You know, you guys you guys threw the early haymaker with the punt return by Ricky Waters. The crowd went crazy. Michigan comes back. They take the lead. You guys come back and take the lead early in the fourth quarter. Michigan comes back. Gillette kicks the field goal to go up 17-16. And then you guys come back and run right down the field and take the lead. And Michigan still has, like you said, a little bit over a minute left. Well, we also kicked four field goals in that game. We couldn't get the ball in the end zone. Yeah. That was also Tony Rice's first – no, he had started the year before. And I'll tell – and I also think that, um, you know, we were really – the thing that's the most interesting about the 88 team mm -hmm. is um, we had something like – I got to go back and count it, but it was like eight or nine first-year starters that were sophomores. Would you like to hear who they were? Yeah. Roll call. Todd Light, Pat wow. Terrell, Dan Smagala, Chris Zorich, uh, Jeff Alm, yeah, Tim uh, Grunhard, Braxton Banks and Anthony Johnson, Ricky Waters, Rocket Ishmael was a freshman. Uh, Tim Ryan, Andy Heck. I mean, dude, are you kidding me? Like, with all of that being said. If nobody knew, you know, you got not half of the team, shit, more than half. Yeah. Were your starters that were great. Yeah. <laughs> so, did so. you guys have the mentality? Because this is Lou's third season. He's 13 and 10. That's his record going into this season. Did you guys have a mentality with like the new stars and everything? Like we're a national championship team from the jump when you were going through camp? I don't think anybody on that team thought we were national champions. I think we thought we were really good. I think we had really started buying into lose. You know, it takes it's it's a mindset as much as anything. Mm -hmm. Learn how to win again and believe and trust in the process. You know, you hear Saban talk about that all the time. It's blue was the same way. Um, and I think when we won the Michigan game, we knew we were good. Uh, and we all, you know, that game was always close back in those days. I mean, it was a field goal at the end of the game every year. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you know, Miami was the the, the – the pinnacle of college football back then. I mean, they had, they had won. I don't know the, you know, they, they were, when we played them, I don't think they lost in two years. I don't know what the streak was. You know, I was on the team that played down there and Jerry Faust's last year that got beat 58, six. They, they blocked a punt with a minute left and threw a touchdown. I mean, they, I hated Miami. Like when I say hate, innate hate, like cut your throat stuff. And um, so, you know, when that whole fight thing broke out in the middle of the, the beginning of the game, I mean, that game, that was the greatest thing that ever happened to us because we weren't backing down to them and we were going to play. You know, I broke my hand in the first quarter of that game, taped my fingers together, had 14 tackles. I never even dreamt of coming out of that game. Yeah. Bro now, I didn't break my finger. I broke my hand. Wow. Yeah. So, um I, I remember I, – I knew it was broken. I looked at it, and I couldn't feel it. And I ran over to the sideline and told Jim Russ to take my – yeah, ran back in. Now, what does that do for you now? Like, going back in mentally, are you thinking about the club now? Is it, like, hurting every tackle? Or, like, how are you working through it? Or you're trying to, like, mentally block it out? Because, like, for me, I'll probably be like, I'm done. <laughs> you're playing quarterback. I didn't – all I thought about was I'm going to hit some fucker in the face with my <laughs> – Dude, I'm going to tell you, when I say we were hard, I don't think people understand how hard we <laughs> had some mean, bad dudes on our team. And I, I would hope to think that I was sort of leading the charge. But, I mean, Zorich, me, 
I mean, all everybody, even man, you go back and watch Todd Light, Pat Terrell, Smigal. <laughs> came up and brought it bro <laughs> running backs concussions i'm so serious. so so the penalties so today's game and the penalties would my whole effort well. i made would have been a would have been <laughs> flagrant high leading with the helmet or late <laughs> but that was just the game back when it was, was, it was game. Just, quarterback folly stands there you got like three seconds to lay him <laughs> So Tom Brady wouldn't be playing Give 20 years. your contact information. I'm not even exaggerating. I'll send you some of my old the old tapes. They're everyone. My kids are like, Dad, that's spearing. I'm like, yeah, that's how they taught us to hit right here with the my helmet. Oh my gosh, they Dude, were teaching I, that. I have my helmet. My entire the whole front of my cage has no plastic on. It's all bent and broken off because I hit everybody with my face and my helmet. Oh my goodness. Wow. But they were teaching that though. That was the That's, that was like what, a, what do you mean? You look the you you hit the ball with your face mask. Oh my goodness. Square. And then you know, you gotta get your shoulder across and drive. Like you know, you get your head to the side, but so the whole tackling low thing wasn't like it like, was you know, you no, see guys no, today I hitting the ankles. techniques of tackling really were still I mean the technique was the, if the you, you know you get your head on the out you got to get your head across their body you got to get your head in front and your shoulders and your shoulders wrap up and drive but now you got dbs shooting ankles and and grabbing they got, they got it's a totally different and the kids are also a lot bigger stronger fast you know i mean i don't know it would be interesting to see us line up and play i don't think they'd know what the hell hit them cuz <laughs> Like guys drooling and blowing like the first play. Dude, they'd be blowing snot bubbles and growling and punching them. And I mean, they'd be like, what the f like now, this is like Neanderthal shit. Like, what is going on? So, so what y'all communication was different. Y'all wasn't telling yeah. like go to the flat, uh, get that A no, gap. We had, no, like, I'm, ah. I'm, I'm counter selling that. We we had guys. We, we we it was a little bit more sophisticated. Now Lou's offense was a little bit more sophisticated, but not a whole. I you know I don't have anything to do with the offense. I know our defensive coordinator was Barry Alvarez, and oh we yeah, were as complicated as we needed to be. The thing is, on defense, we were so good, we didn't do anything. We just lined up and played. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Maybe like you know, we go man. All right, you take that guy. You take. All right, we'll lock your asses down. All right, zone. All right, what are you gonna do? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I'm I called the signals, and that's what's so funny about that year. We never, we didn't. I mean, we did some stunts up front, and we, but that wasn't like that was about it. It was like we were gonna uh, tackle you, flex defense, and then I mean, we had it, but we just didn't run it. I'll never forget we played Southern Cal. You know, you forget the Southern Cal game, the last game of the year that year. We're number one; they're number two. We're both ten and zero in the Coliseum. They're a six point favorite. Yeah. And we send Ricky Waters and Tony Brooks home. Right. Before the game. Right. Yeah, rusher and leading receiver. Home. See ya. Late to a meeting. Get out. Bye. Seniors voted on it. Get them the F out. Gone. I don't want to know. Coaches, get out of the room. We're having a meeting. We had a meeting in there. Guys, it's like Braveheart, man. Run higher. Next guy up. Da, da, da. I mean, guys were crying, screaming. That game was over <laughs> we kicked them in the face knocked rodney pete out we just bullied them they were huge too their whole offensive line was 6'6 325 they had a big they were massive we drilled them in the face and um but i'll never forget in that game uh, it was probably my best game of the year so i like to talk about it but um, yeah, that's right but Alvarez called. We blitz every play. It was like both linebackers blitz. I'm like, wow. Next <laughs> blitz. No we're, zone. We're not dropping we're back. This one. He didn't tell me all week. He had. I had no. We hadn't called these blitzes all year. <laughs> and he didn't tell me about it. Man, I was. We were just shooting. We were gone. Just he's like go. He like just go. Like no, relentless. <laughs> relentless. So anyway, that was awesome. It was a fun year, man. What What do you think? What do you think? was the the defining piece during that time for you guys that you watching Notre Dame football the last 10 years have been missing from what y'all had to what we would have been missing or close to getting to? 
I think it's a couple, you know, I think it's an attitude and I, you know, I, I don't know that I can explain it unless you've lived it. Just a true belief that you're not going to lose and you won't accept that you're going to lose. I think we had good talent. We had good coaches, you know, um, but the mindset's a big part of it. Lou was a big game coach. That's Lou, all that matters. Big, <laughs> That's all that matters. Cut it right that, there. that was, you know, dude, like our leader to, was telling us how we were going to beat them and why. Yeah. Y'all believed it. Stepped into the, onto the field. That's what he was talking about. First yeah. we'll be best and we'll be first, blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, and he always had this thing like we played Michigan. I talked to Bo today. Talk about Bo Schimbeckler. I said, Bo, the boys are working hard. Maybe we should take a day off. He goes, nope, coach, I'm not going to do it. We're going to work hard up here in Michigan. It's like, sorry, fellas, I can't give you the day off today. We're going to have to work harder than the boys up there in Michigan. <laughs> Silly shit like that. But, I mean, at the end of the day, Lou had, like, this is how we win. <laughs> he had a whole – he had, like, a formula. This is our formula. These are your priorities. This is, you know – he said the same things every day, and and man, yeah. after a while we were like, maybe we start believing this little guy, and then you know, and then you win. And by, I'm telling you, by the end of that season, bro, we once we beat Miami, it was over. We drilled SC. We beat them by like 20 points, and they were good. And then the next game, then we played West Virginia. Well, West Virginia had beaten everybody by like 28 points. I mean, they were unreal. Yeah. And they had explosive quarterback offense. We freaking sh- knocked Major Harris out the first quarter. <laughs> Don, no, Don, see, yeah, God, not, we're going to no, bully man. you. We bullied people. That's what the difference is. Yeah. We bullied people. And we had swagger. Yeah. Swagger. Was I, was, I was about to say, we were, you guys we're had crazy. characters on that team. What's that? I mean, Chris Zorge was a character. Oh, uh, we had everybody was character. You guys, the knuckleheads, you, Stam, Stonebreaker, you guys were characters. So Madonna <laughs> was a character. Character. You had, you had characters on the offensive side of the ball for you guys to have a meeting and tell the coaches to get out right before <laughs> the biggest game of the year, one versus yeah. two, with everything riding on it. 100%. And sending. Lou didn't want to send them home, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Lou's he didn't. like, what are y'all doing? Yeah, I've heard all kinds of backstories from the coaches. Now, the funny thing is that a lot of the coaches, you know, they really weren't that much older than us, the, the younger guys. And, I, and, and, you know, in the last 35 years since I played there, which is scary, yeah, I've become friends with them. And they love to go back and tell the stories about what Lou was doing behind the scenes when all that was going down. <laughs> He, you know, he popped his head up and said, I'm going to do this and that. And behind the scenes, he's like, I don't want to send them home. We got to figure out a way to keep them here. And they're like, Coach, I don't think the players are going to let them stay. They're going to let them stay. No. <laughs> That's important, though, because the locker room and the morale of that locker room is so vitally important. That's one of the things I tell Malik all the time that sticks out to me as a fan is that no matter what, the brotherhood at Notre Dame is so strong. Like, I don't care what era of a player you talk to, the brotherhood is so strong. And we've recently heard players on this squad this year talk about how the team morale is totally different than it was last year. And I said to myself, man, how are they winning games? And Malik was like, yo, we've always been, it's us against the world. Like we're in here, this locker room, like we we make it happen. And that goes back to the decision you guys were able to make like, Yo, this is our locker room. This is our team, and we're going to take care of it. And that just speaks volumes about Notre Dame football, generation to generation. Look, I think the, you know, I I had, I literally went from the outhouse to the penthouse. I mean, I went from Jerry Faust. I got recruited by Jerry Faust. Yeah. His last year, we won, lost three games or four games. I don't know what it was. We had like I think three game losing streak. Booed off, booed off the field at Notre Dame. To winning, going twelve and zero, and winning a national championship. So I've been in a locker room where there's a dissension and not a brotherhood, and I've been yeah. in a room where there was incredible brotherhood. Yeah, and um, yeah, you, know, you can have the. It's I, look. I don't know what the people have asked me this question for thirty five years. I don't know what the formula is. It's a lot of things. 
it's getting lucky a little bit. It's the coaching. It's the, you know, Lou Holtz letting Barry Alvarez do his thing on defense and us kind of running wild, uh, you know, and sort of setting the tone for the offense and uh, the chemistry all came together. And, you know, I, I mean, I think Lou would tell you that the team in 1989 was, he thought was probably better than the team in 88. Mm. And cause they had, you know, they had, of course they, they only didn't lose a lot of players um, in my year. And the next year, they lose to Miami down there. I guess they went. They won all their games except against Miami. Yeah. But, and Lou but, says that's one of the biggest regrets of his 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 life is not allowing the team to play loose no, against Miami. Pulled him. He didn't let him fight. Miami yeah. would fight again, and he yeah. clipped, clipped their wings instead of letting them. Yeah, because he saw what happened when he let us fight. Well, he didn't know we were going to fight. Anyway, I don't know. It's, you know, I can't, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, if you would have told me going into my fifth year that we were going to win the national championship, looking at our schedule, I would have been like, mm, yeah, that's, that's a Ponzi scheme. But um, we did. So you never know. Never know. <laughs> so it's early on. A game has yet to be played with this new coaching staff in the regular season. What are your early impressions? Uh, Marcus Freeman and the coaching staff. I um, listen, Marcus. I you know I can't say I know him well. I know him well, and I I know I think football and character and characteristics of teams that won, characteristics of teams that did. And I can tell you, he's got a heck of a lot of the positive attributes. I mean, just just getting the ex players involved, embracing the school. The thing that Lou always loved Notre Dame. It wasn't about Lou. It was about Notre Dame and the tradition. And the, and that's how Marcus Freeman has got that day one. That was cool. I, I noticed that immediately because Brian Kelly was only about Brian Kelly. He didn't like Notre Dame. He didn't respect. He didn't care about the tradition or anything else. Marcus Freeman says, look, man, look where I'm standing. Like, look, these are hollowed grounds. These girls. Like, look around. He, like, he takes it in. Players in. I mean, you're just bringing in the players. Like, I went to that legacy weekend thing. That That's going to have so much potential. When you start getting all the players back, and there are some studs that have played football. I mean, business-wise, football-wise, but just the people. The people. Um. And, to, and he's going to start having guys like on the sidelines. I'm telling you, man, it's – look, and, and I met Al Golden, who I, I spent some time with. He seems unbelievable. I loved his – I mean, they, they seem to have it going on, man. I hate to be – I think so, too. I think they got it going on be, in that staff room. Be, you know, I, I always laugh. I don't want to overpromise and under-deliver, but, man, I'm positive about where we are right now. Yeah. I mean, I – I'm positive about the first game. What do you think about first game? He's, he's going to take some blows. He's going to learn. He's going to be thrown in the fire against Ohio State. They're going to be stacked. Um, but I'm not going to get discouraged about it because I think, man, here's another thing, dude. I mean, he can recruit. And let me tell you something. We keep bringing all these kids. I mean, Lou was a great coach. Lou had all these great things. But we had dudes. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean. Let's call a spade a spade. I'd love. I mean, I'd love to say I, you know, I was pretty good myself, but I had a lot of good guys around me. Yeah, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, we hit. You got to have the players, and then I'll, if you got all the other stuff too, well, then, you know, I think I think we are exponentially in a better spot than where we were with Brian Kelly, because yeah. I don't see we were in a terrible rut that. We were just going to win. We're never going to win a national championship, but we might win nine or ten games every year. Yeah. And nothing going. There was no – I didn't feel like we were closing the gap to get to that next level, and I already feel like that's happening. Um, you know, coaching – coaching. I mean, you got to have the players. To me, a head coach in college is all about what you stand for more than anything else. And this guy stands for all the right stuff, so how can I not – be on board with that. I don't know. What do you think, Malik? Yeah, I think yeah, right on, right on the the button where he has all the things that you can't really explain. Like you said earlier, it's like unless you've been in that moment, unless you 
understand the campus and everything involved in the tradition of the program. I think Marcus Freeman, what he's done the best so far is, is understand where he's at. That alone gives the confidence of the people that have been there, people that have been supporting, especially former players, that if you can understand it, getting there your first year of what I've experienced, what you've experienced at our time in Notre Dame, and you can bring that all together and, and what you're trying to do and move forward with, that's what makes it feel like a national championship run. I'm sure down in Alabama, every class that's been through the saving air probably feels like that that next year they're part of the team. <laughs> that the year coming up, because they're great and they're related to the year they were there. So I think Marcus Freeman, if anything, is going to give us the feel that you had in 88 and 89, and, and the year I had in 15. After that, my, our year in 88, the bar, the expectation and the bars of everything that we did went up every year yeah. after, for the next eight. Yeah. Notre Dame was an inch away from winning another national championship, and they got yeah. screwed twice. Yeah. Uh, 93 with Florida State and Boston College, and then the year with Rocket, 91. Yeah. yeah. Four, but. Anyway, but you're right. hundred percent correct, and it's setting the bar. And I don't know. How, how do you guys? How did you guys feel? Like we're talking about, like what the players coming back meant for Notre Dame. What did the Legacy Weekend mean for you guys? What did it do for you guys personally? <laughs> you want me to? Tell, I mean, I, I for me, um. You know, I think when Lou was there, we kind of still felt like we had a connection to the university. Um, and I still knew a lot of the people at school. And and I think in the last 15, 20 years, I've, you know, I don't feel like I've really been a part of that at all on any level. Yeah. On any level. It's crazy. You know? And um, and I, I think it was, I think every single guy that I talked to, whether they were my year young, I mean, I've talked, spent a lot of time talking to guys I didn't know from the 60s and 70s. I want to talk yeah. to, you know, I, I've always done that. I mean, I talk to the current guys too, but I think it, every single person from that, that showed up there that has played at Notre Dame said that this was long overdue. You've got all this potential with all these successful people that have gone through all these experiences right here at your fingertips. It costs you zero. Zero. And Marcus is a genius because he said his whole pitch is Notre Dame four for 40, which is exactly how my dad pitched me. By the way, I didn't want to go to Notre Dame. I wanted to go to Georgia. Okay. <laughs> um, my dad just kept the four for 40. I'm 17 years old. That did not mean anything to me. Only thing that mattered yeah. was SAE party that I had been to the weekend before in Athens with all the pretty girls. That's all. Oh, the pretty girls. Dang. I mean, dude, Athens back in those days, my God. But anyway. But he's pitching this four for 40. He, he said something that I thought was really cool. And this is when I realized the guy's like on the second and third level of thinking this stuff at the right, at the and, and about it the right way. He said, we don't need NIL. What we need is you guys. This is what the players need to understand. This is what you can do. These are your opportunities. These are the businesses you can get in. I'm telling you, that was genius. Yeah. I, I think it opened, of course, it opened our eyes. We already kind of knew it, but I, it had to have opened the current players' eyes. Yeah. It was that connection that, we, like you said, we knew it. We just didn't know how to get everybody right. to get on the but, same Oh, page. by the way, that had never happened before. Never happened before. Yeah, it, it never happened before. <laughs> it was, no, it had never happened. And I think you wait because guys like me and guys that are a lot smarter than me, we're going to think about ways the next time that happens to, to elaborate on that and make it even better. Yes. It, Cause it was, it was so cool that we was like, okay. wait, we could. And then you have to do something. And you have, you know, the next thing you know, man. Yeah. You don't give a shit if you play pro football because you're going to do that. I mean, I played three years. I got hurt. I was getting paid peanuts. My friends were working on wall street. I was calling my agent. I'm like, I quit. He's like, what do you mean? I said, I'm going <laughs> Get He's out like, of here. Said, I'm going to work on Wall Street. Bye. <laughs> I, I, now, I have a broken here. hand and a dislocated shoulder. This is dumb. I'm this is this, yeah, this is dumb. I'm too old for this. Just dumb. Get paid nothing. <laughs> right. So that's lucky lucky podcast talking to Wes Pritchett. 
Now, Wes, I've heard some stories that you can either, you know, choose not to confirm or or you can go ahead and, and let us know what they whether or not they're true. Uh, there's a story that Lou Holtz was so upset in practice about a running play that he told the entire offensive line. No, he pulled one offensive lineman and made the offensive line block with four players to prove <laughs> to that lineman that his worth or he about the job he was doing. And then I want to talk about just how tough it was to play for Joe Moore because you defensive guys got to watch how he went out to his offensive lineman. Did you have a sense of empathy for what they had to go through? Man, it was tough for all of us, to be honest with you. Lou was – I mean, it was horrible. We had those uh, – you know, they didn't have any rules about hitting and time of practice or any – I mean, it was just the way it was. I mean, I can remember in the spring, Lou saying that, you know, spring ball was – was when you had to make the team and we did 30 days of full pads and it was horrible. We scrimmaged the whole time. Yeah. It was hitting drills, one-on-ones. I mean, you could put it this way. There was no hiding. Yeah. The guy played earned it. Yeah. And I don't think anybody on our team, whether it was Joe Moore and yeah, Joe Moore was amazing. He's legendary. He's from another planet. He wouldn't even – he wouldn't be accepted today on any level. They, they could <laughs> – what he would do. He was always smoking cigarettes. I mean, he was – he was he was so old school. But, dude, he coached – I mean, he coached like Bill Fralick. And, I mean, his years at Pittsburgh, he coached the best offensive lineman that probably ever played the game. Um, You know, and he was just brutal. He was brutal. I mean, he just never – let up on those guys. It didn't matter if you were an all American or, or a walk on you had to, you know, it just was fundamentals, fundamentals, fundamentals. And that's all Lou ever did, man. All we did was work on fundamentals. The way we shuffled in our linebacker drills, the way we took a step on the punt team, everything was orchestrated. Always. There was never like my techniques, our techniques were flawless. Yeah. Getting leverage, getting getting off the shooting off the ball low, extending your hands. I mean, just everything was mat- very meticulous. Yeah, and we worked we worked over and over and over and over and over again on on technique, a lot of technique. I mean, yes, we hit and all that, and we and we trained like crazy, but we worked a lot. Lou was a tactician too. Now, um. And that carried over, I think, into all the positions. So, I mean, there's no look, no shortcut. I mean, you got to have good players. You got to have a good coach. You got to play. Yeah. You got to get lucky. Yeah. Kind of, you know, you got to you got to make sure your key guys don't get hurt over the course of the year. We had very little injuries, if any. Yeah. My senior year, very little injuries. I mean, you know. So I don't know. What's your favorite? We know, of course, ultimately defeating uh, West Virginia in the Fiesta Bowl, pinnacle of that season. If you were going to bookmark one moment from that season to let someone, to let a Notre Dame fan in 2022, that's a teenager, know what Notre Dame football is all about, what would be that moment? If you were sitting down, with a young teenager right now that's a Notre Dame fan, and you had to pull up one thing on YouTube. What it would be? What would it be to let them know what that season was all about and what Notre Dame football is all Man, about? That's a hard question. There were so many. You let out for me, and this is something I jokingly say because I don't like the visitors' entrance now. Yeah, I grew up watching you guys come through that tunnel. Yeah, with Miami, with USC, and whether it was a fight or brawl or just talking trash back and forth. I just, for me, that was college football. Like that's, that's how you I mean, you'd, have to say, you'd have to say the fight in the tunnel against Miami. Yeah. yeah. I think that defined our entire season because those guys had punched us in the face three years in a row, you know, and um, we're warming up and they're down the other end and, and they ran right through our drill intentionally. And we were let them know that that was not going down. Right. Yeah. You know? And, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess if I had to pick one, that would be more of a, yeah, because I think that's, 
reflective of sort of our attitude. And that was, and that changed the entire, not that it changed the entire season, but after we won that Miami game, like I said, I mean, that, there was, it was on, it, nobody was going to beat us after that. Now I'm glad we didn't have to play them again, <laughs> but um, that would have been interesting if we had played them again, like in the playoff, that would have been, mm. cause I think, I think we would have adjusted. I, physically, they could not beat us. Schematically, they could. Like running the ball and all that, we I, we were, I, we'd throw their linemen around, but their their offense was way advanced for the time. You know, so. yeah. So it would have been interesting to see how you guys would have adjusted to that. I think offensively, Lou would have adjusted, and I think you guys would have been more acclimated to seeing what they showed you guys the first time. Yeah, Barry, let me tell you, here's another thing, and don't kid yourself. Alvarez is every bit as good of a coach as Lou Holtz. I mean, I, I, I to have, to th- to have been coached by Lou and Barry at the same time is, I mean, that's like yeah. legendary stuff. And I'm still friend. In fact, why I was you- texting Barry Alvarez yesterday. Why do you think he doesn't get the same acclaim at it, at Notre Dame at the same time? Because, you know, you always hear about Lou driving the train. Well, I mean, he did. Barry would tell you he wasn't driving the train. He was just trying to take care of the defense. But <laughs> I, I can just tell you that, you know, uh, the impact that he had on all of our players and how much we loved him. And then he was only there for two years and he left. Mm. So, um, you know, there was always rumors that um, – he was going to come back and be the head coach. And I don't know whatever happened there, but, but if you look at what he did at Wisconsin as a head coach, oh. I mean, that's unbelievable. They were Wisconsin didn't even exist. And they won, he won five Rose bowls and six yeah, crazy championships. I mean, unbelievable what he accomplished there. Um, He's a great athletic director as well. Great. Yeah, athletic director. Director. I mean, guys had, he has had a, and I'm just telling you, he had even a, probably a bigger – he and Lou both had equally big impacts on my life. But, you know, Barry, I was a fifth-year senior. So, I, I mean, hell, I was like a player coach. I was down in the coach's office. And I mean, I'd watch film with him all day. I mean, I'd walk into yeah. – he'd take me into the coaches' meetings. He did it one time. He's like, Prince, just come on in the meeting. I sit down, and Lou sits down. And he's like talking. He looks over and goes, Wesley, what the hell are you doing in this? Get your ass out of here. I'm like, yeah, he's like, ah, I guess you're not invited, Prince. Sorry about that. But I mean, yeah, I, my man. Literally, like, <laughs> I would sit in Barry's office. Digger Phelps was like two offices down. He'd come in. It was it, it was surreal. I mean, I'm sitting around with legends, you know. Yeah. At the time, I didn't think yeah. anything about it, but what an experience. I about it. You didn't realize how special that was at the oh. time, right? Yeah. You no, know, you're young. I mean, I was 21 years old. I didn't, you know. Yeah, in hindsight, it's incredible what what all that's you know what we had. Um, Barry, Barry, the way that he his technique was totally different than Lou's, but very effective. Like he would call us into his office. You know, he'd call me in, you know, because we had a good time. Now, you know, I don't know if you read like you know with me smoking cigars in my helmet, and we did all kinds of goofy shit. Uh, you know, we'd send the freshmen down to see Lou all the time. We, I mean, we, there's a lot of stories, but Barry knew when to like button it up. You know what I mean? And he'd call us into the office and be like, look, no screwing around today. Like I want you guys to get going. And then we would go out and, and like demand another level from the younger guys. And we weren't fucking around and we were serious and we were focused and they knew it immediately. So that was kind of like the, you know, I think the way that the and, and being a fifth year senior like that, you know, I think hell, we had a nice barbell combination of old guys and young bucks that were players. Yeah, yeah, and that was that was a good you know a good um, mixture I think too. Um, you know, but you didn't hear Malik when I was saying the first year starters on that team were. Um, Rocket Ishmael, Ricky Waters, Andy Heck, Tim Grunhard, Tim Ryan. Who else on offense? Is that anybody else that played in the NFL? Good grief. 
Uh, I'm trying to think. I think there's one more. And then on defense was Chris Zorich, Mike Stonebreaker, Pat Terrell, Stan Smagala, um, Jeff Holm, all NFL guys. Yeah. So we had a let we had eleven guys, first year starters that were sophomores that all played in the NFL. <laughs> what was that moment like the first time That's you crazy. saw Rocket? How about that? What was That's the crazy. first time you saw Rocket in a practice? Like when you first, the first time you saw him in action, what were your thoughts? You know, it's funny. Back in those days, man, we it was like two different teams. Like the offense and the defense did not play together. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Lou. Nobody wanted to be near Lou, and Lou didn't want anybody near. So we wanted the the offense, but there was plenty of practices where we had gone in, showered, eaten dinner, and those fools were still out there practicing. <laughs> Great. Barry yeah, was like to see the units. Like, Y'all are no done. Team he was in showers. He was the unit. Set the clock back to period twenty. And we'd be like, "Oh man, oh, Barry's man. like, y'all are done. Get out of here." <laughs> wow. So we talked. To answer versus. your question, I yeah. mean, I, I didn't even pay attention to the offense, and much less a wide receiver, unless. Uh, unless I was playing him, I, I was so focused on what I was doing. But I, I would be in, it would have been in a game. First time, you know, I, all of a sudden I saw some like freaking just like <laughs> the flash go run. I mean, dude, that guy was so fast. It was like, and I had played with Tim Brown. So it's not like I hadn't been around guys that were pretty fast. Tim yeah. Brown was fast. Rocket was faster. <laughs> yeah. If that was even possible, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. He was – Rocket was so – in a straight line, I mean, he was just – it was crazy. I, you know, it didn't take – Tony – you know, he was – so we didn't – Rocket was a freshman. So it wasn't until later in, on in the season that we started throwing the ball to him because Lou realized that nobody could cover him. So, and all we did, we'd line up and smash it in everybody's face, and then all of a sudden he could play action, and he – Figured out Tony could take three steps and throw it as far as he could, and Rocket could run under it because nobody was going to be there but Rocket. Right, that's crazy. So, so, what are you looking forward to with this season? You said it's going to be a tough task going into the horseshoe. You know, I just want to see him. Uh, you know, I just you, you only learn by jumping in the fire anyway. I mean, I, you know, I, look, the Oklahoma state game was disappointing. Um, I think that, you know, you had your offensive and defensive coordinators though, like already gone or new guys coming in or interim that, that makes it really tough. You haven't, you know, he's got to, have, have, I can tell you this, Al Golden from what, any, every, anything that from me doing research on him and talking to the guy, they're going to be good on defense. I think we're going to be really good on defense. Really, really good. I think. I so. think we're going to be really good on defense. Um, you know, on off. I, 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 I man, just play hard and be and be in the game. That's that's all I'm looking for. Effort, effort, yeah. effort. I just want to see effort. You know, that's all I've ever told my kids. You can't worry about anybody else. You just when you go out there, it's you can only worry about yourself. I mean, you yeah. can motivate the other guys, but yeah. yeah. But you also you are in charge of how hard you play. That's fair. And what you think is a hundred percent today ain't gonna be a hundred percent when you go to the you know what I mean? Like yeah, what I fair. thought was full speed in high school. What I thought was full speed my freshman year in college was not full speed my fifth year in college. No. You know, yeah, this is one of the most important months in recruiting. A lot of big time recruits will be coming to visit Notre Dame. A lot of 25 kids coming in for camps, along with 24 kids. There are two kids coming in that Notre Dame are trying to get that are five stars, both from the state of Georgia. Have Notre Dame in their top three. Who is that? Is safety name Caleb, Caleb Downs. Downs. And a gentleman, a young man, uh, Malik actually talked to last night, Samuel and Pimba, who's at IMG Academy. What's he play? Out of Georgia. He uh, linebacker. Yeah. Linebacker. What Great. would you tell Great. those guys, Georgia kids, deciding to leave the South and go to Notre Dame? What would be your pitch to them to say, "Yo, to them was look, you're going, you're not going to play. I mean, you're going to, you're not going to get any more exposure than you're ever going to get on in TV and playing great teams than you are at Notre Dame." First yeah. of all, yeah, you just know. 
from a football perspective, you're going to get every bit as much opportunity to play in the NFL as you would at Georgia. Now, if you get hurt your first year, you go to Notre Dame and you graduate, you're going to have a degree that can get you a job in any industry in any state in the United States. The alumni stick together. It's not even comparable. The degree from Notre Dame and the degree from the, – Georgia is a good school, and it truly is a good school. But nobody gives a shit outside of the state of Georgia. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that you're not going to have opportunities, but I, there's nothing like a Notre Dame degree, um, especially if you played football and went to Notre Dame. It's just the ability. It opens your – it opens your – it'll open your mind as far as – people that you're going to meet from all. I mean, there was the greatest, I was a Southern kid that had never been North in North Carolina. I was completely <laughs> out of my comfort zone on every level, football, <laughs> socially, everything, weather. And it was, yeah, it weather. sucked. I was hard. I hated it. I wanted to come home my freshman year. I was the only guy on scholarship that got red shirted. I was 10th string. I mean, the stories go on and on and on. And my dad got on the phone one day. He's like, Wesley, you made a decision, and by God, you're going to stick with it and quit feeling sorry for yourself. I don't want to talk about this shit anymore. Click. And that was it. <laughs> that was it. But I, and I think, you know, look, these kids, these five star kids, I mean, they can go anywhere and have a great time. They can go anywhere and, and, and play great football. But I mean, you know, it's, there's more to it than just the game. What if you get hurt? The, the my high school coach said to me, "What go some? Where will you be happy if you got hurt the first play?" Yeah. Mm. yeah. And I said, "UCLA." <laughs> no, I'm joking. Hell yeah! <laughs> Thank God I didn't take a trip out there. Uh, Lucky Lefty Podcast. We are so appreciative of the legendary linebacker, 1988 champion Wes Pritchett, joining us today all the way from that peach state and um, success to you and your young men, your Thanks. sons that are uh, looking to get that power five offer and pursue their dreams. And you guys, as, as I said before, when we introduced you, uh, I speak on behalf of the fan base, the blood, sweat and tears and the brotherhood that you guys represent is the best thing about being a Notre Dame fan. We would love to win a national championship. We would love to have titles delivered to us on an annual basis, but to take a step back and have the pride in the men that you all are on and off the field, as well as your attributes and everything that you've been able to accomplish on the field. That's the one thing as a Notre Dame fan, as a fan base that we take pride in. And we appreciate everything that you've given us on and off the field and how you continue to be a great ambassador for the school and the, and the uh, football program. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for having us. And, um, you know, go Irish and Malik. Great to see you. And I uh, hope to see you next time I'm up there. Yeah, And absolutely. You know, I, hope, I, hope be, I hope we're talking about Marcus Freeman's national championship. No, nothing would excite me more. Heck yeah! How many, right. how many games are you going to get to this year? You know, I don't know. I'm going to. I'm planning on going to a couple of games this year. I haven't been in a couple of years. Um, I think I'm definitely going up to the uh, that the Lou Holtz game, which is the second home game, and mm -hmm. then I might go to the Clemson game or the BC game. All right. Well, we thank you, Wes Pritchard, for All joining right. us right here on the Lucky Lefty Podcast. Thank you, sir. Bye. Have a good one. That was Wes Pritchard. Member, line, former linebacker and member of the 1988 National Championship team. Malik had to get out, get ready to go to practice. And we thank you guys for joining us. We're going to continue to spin it different tomorrow. Former Notre Dame linebacker Kendall Moore joins us tomorrow. We're going to have another great conversation. Look forward to bringing it to you guys. Brought to you by Anora Whiskey, AnoraWhiskey.com. That premium American whiskey, AnoraWhiskey.com. For the original Lucky Lefty, Malik Zaire, I'm Sean Davis at SD2 Mics. Enjoy the rest of your day, and as always, spin it different.